Alright, so today we're going to be talking about our friend the mole. Now, there is one number that is very important when we are discussing the mole, and this is Avogadro's number. So here is Avogadro's uh, number. Um, it's generally just abbreviated N sub A, and the A is capital here, to, so you don't confuse it with sodium. And the value is 6.02214129, plus or minus uh, basically up to 27 in the last uh, decimal places here. Um, so this is just the uncertainty in that particular value, times 10 to the 23rd per mole. And generally what we do is we just approximate this as 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd uh, per mole and, and are done with it there. Okay, and actually this uh, 0.000027 uh, works out to be about 44 parts per billion uncertainty. So this is how well known Avogadro's number actually is. Okay, now to explain what these weird units are, because it's per mole, we're just going to take a little deviation here just to kind of explain the significance of this here. Let's assume you are Taylor Swift, and you need to organize your concert, and of course, when you're having your concert, you need to buy food. Well, let's just make up um, a new unit, and we're going to call it, you know, the concert unit, and we're going to say this concert is equal to 5,000 things. Now, of course, if you're having your concert, you need to have food. You know, let's just say we're serving hamburgers. And so if you have a hamburger, of course, you're going to need the patties. So the hamburger patties, which work out to be, let's just say, 0 0.200 kilograms. And you're also going to need buns. Right? And let's say these work out to be 0 0.15 uh, kilograms. Hamburger patties obviously weigh different amounts than the hamburger buns. But of course, you know, we just need 5,000 of these things here. Now, if you're dealing with very large numbers, you know, your people who you're ordering it from really don't feel like counting out 5,000 individual burgers all the time. They just want to weigh out a certain amount and then know that on the other end, you're getting the quantities that you actually need. So, you know, if you're Taylor Swift, you go there and you don't say, I need 5,000 um, actual burgers and 5,000 pairs of buns, uh, you go and say, you know, how many pounds of uh, hamburgers you need and how many pounds of buns you need. So instead, what you're going to do here is say that, you know, let's say if you're having your one concert, this is going to work out to be 1,000 kilograms of patties per concert and 75 kilograms of buns per concert. And this means that when you order your stuff, you're just going to say, well, I'm holding one concert here. There's 5,000 people coming. I'm going to need 5,000 burgers. And then the vendor doesn't have to actually go there and actually count out 5,000 individual burgers. He just has a giant scale and then just keeps plopping all the burgers on there until he reaches uh, 1,000 kilograms of that. And then another scale that has 75 kilograms of the buns, sips it in the truck, and then Taylor Swift's nice and happy, right? Well, what we're basically doing right here is analogous to the atomic or molecular weights. All right. Essentially, what we're going on here is, you know, if we're dealing with different elements in the periodic table, you know, which have different atomic weights here, and we're going to be looking at this in more detail in a bit, uh, what we want to be able to do is weigh out, you know, equal quantities of these atoms without having to actually count them out. And this is where the whole mole concept actually comes in. Another way we can kind of write this out here, instead of, you know, this very complicated, this is, you know, the official definition of this. The way you can use, just usually write this out is 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd. And instead of just having per mole, I put in here things. And when I'm talking about things, this can, well, represent anything, right? This can be um, atoms, molecules, electrons, birds. <laughs> Okay, birds, people, whatever. You know, it's it's whatever quantities you're counting, you all you want is this many things. And we're just saying things here because again it can represent anything. Just like above here with our example, you know, we could talk about patties or buns. You know, it doesn't matter what we're actually talking about, all that matters is that we have the correct number of things actually there. Another way that this can actually operate is um, as a conversion between uh, grams that you're actually dealing with and what you're measuring out and the actual mass of the atoms themselves. So this is a conversion between atomic mass units and these are you know just something that's a little bit more convenient you know if you're dealing with protons um, it's just more convenient to talk about the proton being approximately one AMU rather than talking about you know how many grams it actually is there. So this is a nice little conversion between the atomic scale and the macro scale that we deal with um, on every day. Now, one thing just to note right here is that um, the SI base unit is kilograms, 
this is grams, okay, that we're actually dealing with. And it's just one thing to remember when we're talking about energies later on that, you know, these atomic weights here are representative of how many grams per mole these are. And, you know, for dealing with energies, those would have to be represented in terms of kilograms. So we have to have a factor of a thousand difference here. And when that actually happens, again, I'll remind you, but, you know, just, just be aware that these values here are going to be um, in terms of grams. Now, why is this actually called Avogadro's number? Well, a little bit of history here. So in uh, 1811, um, while they were formulating the gas laws, and when we actually talk about gas laws later in the semester, we'll talk about this in much more detail, uh, he actually came up with a hypothesis which was actually very, very important for figuring out the gas laws here. And what he basically said was that equal volumes of gases at the same pressure and temperature contain the same number of molecules. Now, what does this mean? So let's say we have here three balloons. Uh, one contains hydrogen, another one contains carbon dioxide, another one contains xenon. So three very, very different gases, different masses, different densities, you know, everything. But they're all being held under the exact same conditions. So these things have the same pressure, they're at the same temperature, and the volumes are exactly the same. And if these three things are uh, held, they also contain the same number of hydrogen molecules, same number of carbon dioxide molecules, and the same number of xenon atoms, okay? Um, because, of course, xenon is monoatomic. But that's actually a very, very profound statement. So, you know, if we just look at this with normal substances, like uh, just between liquids or just between solids, that obviously does not hold true. You know, if I have a block of copper and a block of iron, uh, even if they're at the same volume and obviously same pressure and temperature, uh, the number of atoms inside of each block is going to be very different because the densities uh, vary by quite a bit. So this only works for gases and is actually a, a very, very important thing. And this was actually a very instrumental uh, later on when they actually formed the ideal gas law. And you may have heard of this before. So this was formed with the ideal gas law, PV equals NRT in 1834. This wasn't by Avogadro, by the way. This was uh, by uh, Clapeyron, who actually uh, formulated the ideal gas law. But um, his work was actually, you know, a lot of, or I should say, a lot of his work that he did over here was actually based upon uh, what Avogadro um, helped figure out. Okay, so Avogadro figured this out in 1811. Avogadro then died in 1856. Um, but in, and during the intervening years, there were some attempts to actually figure out what this number was. So actually, Avogadro never actually knew what his number was. Um, it wasn't discovered until a few decades uh, after his death. So there were some attempts, and you know, we can, we'll look at this little thing here. I'll just stick that in. Um, but really, the first pretty good attempt that actually came out was in 1908 by Perrin. All right, and then when he, uh, well, his estimate of Avogadro's number, he actually proposed that uh, this value that, you know, they were searching for for such a long time actually be named after Avogadro um, in his honor. All right, and then from henceforth, it, it was known as Avogadro's number. And then over the last century, uh, they've been, you know, getting better and better measurements of Avogadro's number. All right, another one was actually a few years later. Um, you remember Milliken? So remember Milliken from the Milliken oil drop experiment? Well, uh, he was actually able to give an estimate of Avogadro's number from the oil drop experiment itself. Because remember, what he figured out in that oil drop experiment was the individual charge of an electron. There were some experiments that they were doing known as electroplating. And this wasn't done by Milliken, but this was done, you know, previously. Where essentially what you're doing is you're taking an ion, so let's just say some ion here, plus an electron, to give you the solid piece of metal, or a different ion, plus two electrons in this case, to give you the metal. And when you're doing this electroplating, what you're essentially doing is you're taking a current and passing it through there. Now, remember, this was the uh, late 1800s, um, early 1900s, and at that point, they actually were able to very accurately measure amounts of current. All right, so this wasn't uh, something that was very difficult. This was very easy to do at the time. So when they were able to measure these currents, what they can do is, Okay, so current times time is equal to charge, or from the units that we know, this is amps times seconds is equal to coulombs. And remember, the charge on the electron is in coulombs. So once Millikan went through here, figured out the charge on the electron, 
And now they can do these experiments over here with electroplating. They knew exactly how many electrons actually went in there. So what you basically did was you would say, you know, this many electrons put down this many grams of the metal. They knew basically what the atomic weights of the metals were at that time and also the other elements and we'll be seeing how they figured that out in a minute. So from these electroplating experiments, you could say that, you know, so many coulombs put down so many grams of the metal. But now that we knew what the charge of the electron was, we can say how many electrons put down how many grams of the metal. And since we knew how many electrons were actually there, we can actually figure out, well, how many atoms that actually works out to be. Because it's like either a 1 to 1, a 2 to 1, a 3 to 1 ratio that comes out of there. So it actually was very powerful and gave a pretty good estimate um, of Avogadro's number uh, for that time. All right, now these were the early methods. Uh, later methods actually used something known as X-ray crystal density. Okay, essentially what um, you're doing here is you have a crystal, you shine an x-ray through it, and from there you can figure out the atomic spacing of your crystal. So essentially you'll have over here your little crystal like so, and you know what your atomic spacing is here. Okay, so I know what my little spacing of my atoms is inside the crystal, and how far they are actually spaced apart from one another. I can figure out how many atoms are actually in there. So it's the same thing like, you know, if you know the size of your oranges, uh, you know, when you have a crate full of oranges, well, you can figure out how many oranges are actually in there, right? So it's the same basic thing that um, is going on here. So this essentially is a method of counting atoms, and this is really the way that Avogadro's number is figured out in modern systems here. So those are the main methods. There's some other ones there too, but, you know, that's, that's just the, the main ones, you know, that we're, we're kind of interested in here. All right, now Avogadro's number is a very, very big number, and you know, as we said before, when we were looking at, you know, these concerts, no one really wants to worry about, you know, trying to count out large numbers like this. We just want to weigh things. Well, let's say we wanted to actually try and count out Avogadro's number here. How long would that actually take? So there's Avogadro's number. And we'll do the, you know, very similar to when we looked at how long it would actually take to count the number of atoms in the universe. This is very similar to that. So what I basically said here is that we're going to be counting one trillion atoms per second. Why one trillion? It's just an arbitrary number I picked because, you know, one trillion tends to be a number that is very, very large, but that most of us are actually familiar with. You know, it could go to one quadrillion, but, you know, we don't really think about, you know, quadrillions that much. But trillions, you know, we have trillion dollar debt, uh, terabyte hard drive. So, you know, we're, we're kind of familiar with the size of a trillion here. So um, we'll just say arbitrarily, every second we count out one trillion atoms from the sample. And then, of course, we just want to convert this, you know, into hours and days and, and years from there. So here is my uh, thing here, and then we can see everything cancels out. My atoms go away, my seconds go away, my hours go away, my days go away, and I'm left here with years per mole. Okay, so this will basically just tell us how long this will take, and we can run through this calculation, and what we basically get here is approximately 19,100 years per mole. All right, so it's not quite as ridiculous as counting out all the atoms in the universe, but still 19,000 years, that's a long time. Uh, to measure these things out. So, you know, no one is actually going to sit down and actually count out a mole of atoms. You know, it is physically impossible to do anything like that. So as for defining the mole, if you remember back to when we defined the SI units as to what the mole was, we said that the mole is defined as, you know, the amount of atoms in exactly 12 grams of carbon-12. And this is how it's actually uh, defined nowadays. And also remember that we said here that this is a nice way to convert between um, atomic mass units and grams here. So we'll see exactly how this works here. So one atom of carbon-12 weighs exactly 12.000000 AMU and one mole of carbon-12 weighs exactly 12.000 grams. Okay, now of course one question that you might have is why is carbon-12 uh, used as the standard. You might think, you know, why don't we just use hydrogen? Wouldn't that be a lot easier? Uh, why did carbon-12 actually come out of this? Well, there's a little bit of uh, history behind this, and we'll just touch upon this a little bit. All right, so pre-1960, uh, oxygen equals 16 grams was used as the standard. Um, Pre-1900, um, they actually used hydrogen equals one gram as the standard, although 
um, when we were actually looking at the history before 1900, before Avogadro's number and the whole mole thing was defined, there were actually multiple standards going back and forth, and that's you know a longer history lesson than we want to get into, um, because it was a lot of disagreement as they were trying to figure out well how much do these things actually weigh, and you know there was there were multiple standards that were actually going around. Now, of course, one question is well, why was oxygen? Um, chosen as a standard before 1960. Well, you have to remember when they were figuring out atomic weights back then, uh, what they needed to do was all basically chemical methods. So the way they would do this is they would react something with oxygen and then you could actually figure out what the um, atomic weight of that was. And the reason oxygen was chosen, of course, because on the periodic table, oxygen basically reacts with pretty much everything on here, um, except for um, a couple of the noble gases over here, uh, oxygen reacts with pretty much everything. Um, so that's very, very nice. Uh, meanwhile, hydrogen doesn't. Okay, there's you know certain things it reacts with. That's nice, but other you know atoms and stuff it doesn't really react with. So that's kind of a problem because then basically you'd be using your oxygen standard over here, reacting it. Then you have to find the ratio between that and the hydrogen. It's just an extra layer of complexity that you don't want to uh, have happen. And of course, once you do that. Um, you every time you know like the hydrogen to oxygen mass ratio changes that's going to change everything else here on the periodic table but if you just stick here with the oxygen that you know kind of defines everything nicely in, in one fell swoop all right so that explains why oxygen was used pre-1960 but then why did we move towards the carbon standard that we have nowadays what happened was in the late 50s um, there's a gentleman known as Alfred Neer and he was actually from the University of Minnesota. He used mass spectroscopy. I remember the mass spectroscopy determines the mass of each isotope of the element exactly. All right, well, I shouldn't say exactly, but to a very, very high degree of accuracy. And this occurred around 1955. All right, so of course, you know, it takes a couple of years once you find out your new standard to, you know, apply it and get it accepted by everybody here. Now, this is a very, very accurate thing. So when before when we were doing these chemical methods that were done with the oxygen, you basically had to use multiple grams of a substance reacted with the oxygen and then figure out how much reacted and figure out the atomic weight that way. Um, so you need very, very large sample sizes. Um, and also uh, what was actually realized as methods actually improved that there were slight isotopic differences uh, between you know, where you got your samples from based upon you know, the history of the chemical. There could be you know, slightly higher oxygen or, or hydrogen isotopes you know, in one area versus another there. So that uh, you know, was a problem there. But the mass spectroscopy here, you can very accurately determine two things at once. First of all, the mass of your isotopes, you could know that to you know, multiple sig figs of accuracy, and also the abundances of the isotopes, which really from the chemical methods, there was no way of knowing that. So now you could very accurately pin down you know, any differences in the samples and quantify them. And also, uh, before when we were dealing with the chemical method here, just using oxygen, oxygen actually has three stable isotopes. Oxygen 16, which is the most abundant, but there's also in smaller quantities, uh, oxygen 17 and oxygen 18. And you know, just saying, well, the oxygen equals 16 from the mass spectroscopy is not the same stuff as the oxygen you get from the air, which is going to have these other isotopes. So there's you know, extra errors that you actually have in there. So eventually what uh, they did was they chose carbon-12 as the nice standard because that was what the uh, mass spectroscopists were doing. And also it turned out that by using the carbon standard, there was a very small change in the current value, or at the time, the oxygen standard current values of the atomic weights. And when they redefined it to be the carbon standard, there was like only like a several parts per billion change on that. So it wasn't a large error. Uh, when they did the redefinitions here. And of course, chemists were very happy because this way they didn't have to recalculate uh, everything as they're going along. So that's why, you know, as of right now, and pretty much, you know, we're always going to be sticking with this, uh, the one atom of carbon-12 is exactly 12 AMUs, and this is what uh, we're going to be doing here. And again, you know, the one mole of carbon-12 is exactly 12 grams. So this is the standard um, that we actually use. Now, how do we actually, you know, use this, you know, in real life? Okay, so just we're going to look here at um, the old periodic table just to gain a little bit of an understanding what is actually going on here. So this is, you know, just a blown up thing of, you know, the uh, element carbon here, what we have. So, of course, on the top here, remember, this is just your atomic number. 
And then of course here we have, you know, the elements, name and symbol. And then here, of course, this is your atomic weight. Now, when we're dealing with the atomic weight, again, um, remember we talked about that carbon is exactly 12. Well, this is obviously not 12, right? This is 12.107. So why is there this little bit of a discrepancy? That's because there are two major isotopes. There's the carbon 12 that we all know and love, which is exactly, by definition, 12.00000 and so on. And then there's also carbon 13, which is 13.00. So anyway, carbon-13 is uh, just a little bit heavier than the 12.00. Uh, um, and also what happens is that the abundance is here. So the um, carbon-12 is about 99%. Carbon-13 is about 1%. And remember the way that we actually figured out the uh, atomic weights um, from the atomic mass. So here's my atomic masses, by the way. Yeah, so these are atomic masses, and then of course you just multiply it by the abundances and add them up. And when you do that, um, we get here what our atomic weight actually is. Now, these are the atomic weights, and whenever we're doing calculations, you know, these are the numbers that we're going to be using, right? So anytime we figure out how many grams per mole, that's what we're going to be using. Now, the units on this are going to be grams per mole. Okay, and that's the units, and that is very important to know that because we're going to be seeing it uh, quite often. Um, the other thing is also, uh, this is exactly equivalent to saying AMUs, okay? Grams per mole and AMUs are numerically the same unit. So if you know what your unit is here, and remember here, remember one mole was equal to 12 grams, so that's the same thing as grams per mole. Well, right here, that's the same thing as saying AMUs per atom. You know, they're numerically the same thing. So um, right here, if we figure out our atomic mass in grams per mole, we can also figure this out in terms of AMU very, very easily. All right, so basically what this means right here is that if you go to a scale and you very carefully put on there 12.0107 grams of carbon, you will exactly have one mole of carbon. And if you have one mole of carbon, that means you have your 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atoms of carbon. So that's what that means. Okay, now for instance, here we have fluorine. Now if we just take this one stable isotope, we can actually figure out well, what the mass of a fluorine atom actually is. So if I just take this value right here, so 18.9984032 grams of fluorine, that's the same thing as one mole of fluorine. Well, right here, if this is this many grams is this many atoms, well, if I just go through here and divide by Avogadro's number, well, if I just divide these two numbers out, I wind up with, all right, what we figure, figure out here is that every atom of fluorine weighs 3.1547 times 10 to the minus 23rd grams, all right? And this, you know, is about, you know, what a normal atom or molecule actually does weigh. So from this, we can actually, you know, just take another step here and actually figure out well, what is an AMU in terms of grams? And we can have a nice little conversion factor here. All right, so as we said earlier, one AMU is the same thing as one gram per mole. But then I can take this mole here and this multiply it by Avogadro's number by saying one mole is my 6.023. And of course, my moles cancel out. I'm just gonna be left here with grams. And this is going to work out to be so right here, one AMU is 1.66 times 10 to the minus 24th grams. And this is a very important conversion factor right here. But really, we could just kind of write this. You know, I know this is, you know, I will put conversion factors and stuff on there. But another way you could think about this is that this is 1 over Avogadro's number of grams is equal to 1 AMU. Okay, so if you just remember what Avogadro's number is, take the reciprocal of it that's one AMU. And this right here is, you know, a very important uh, conversion factor. Uh, conversely, you know, we can just, you know, move this over to the other side here. So we could just as equivalently say over here that 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd atomic mass units is equal to one gram, or just take Avogadro's number and multiply it um, by, you know, the AMUs to get here one gram. Both of those are kind of equivalent expressions, and if you, you know, just remember, you know, the size difference between them, um, it's actually quite easy to uh, do these conversions. So let's just do a few examples here and how we can convert these. 
So let's say I have here 7 times 10 to the 21st particles of something, you know, either atoms, molecules, whatever. And then we simply just divide here by Avogadro's number, and we're going to get 6 times 10 to the 23rd particles for this, and we wind up with 0. 0.012 moles of the substance here. Um, another one, let's say I have 55 moles of water. So again, here is 55 moles times Avogadro's number, and we get 3.3 times 10 to the 25th molecules of water. Now, another thing we could also ask, well, in these many molecules of water, how many atoms of hydrogen and oxygen do we actually have here? So uh, what we did here, we have 3.3 times 10 to the 25th molecules of water. And now every water molecule, there is one atom of oxygen, right? It's H2O. So if we have here one molecule of, of or one molecule of water, one atom of oxygen, well that's just the same number we started with, just this many atoms of oxygen. Now of course we do this for hydrogen. Well there are two hydrogens per every water. So we just multiply this by two over one. And again here the molecules of H2O would cancel out and I just wrote it this way because I didn't feel like writing it twice. Um, but then we'd have here the molecules of water, they cancel out, this gives us how many atoms of hydrogen, so that's just double this number. And then of course we can just add these up, 3.3 .3 plus 6.6, .6, that's going to be 9.9 .9 times 10 to the 25th uh, atoms total that we actually have here. Alright, and continuing, let's just take another example here. Let's look at the average human, which weighs 70 kilograms. Now the humans are about 70% water, right? So we just want to figure out how many moles of water are in the average person here. So we can just multiply these two numbers together. So there's about 49 kilograms, give or take, uh, per person. Now water is going to be 18 grams per mole, and that's the molecular weight of water. And the way we got that, over here oxygen, whoops, oxygen is 16. And then we have two hydrogens, so that's going to be plus two. So 16 plus two is, of course, 18. Now, of course, this water molecule here, this 18 grams per mole, is also the same thing as 18 uh, AMU. And we saw the conversion earlier up here that is 1.66 times 10 to the minus 24 grams. So that means that this water molecule here is going to be one. So this means that the water molecule is going to be about you know 2.99 times 10 to the minus 23rd grams per water molecule here. Now of course the other thing is we just want to figure out how many moles this uh, works out to be. So again we have here 49 and because this was of course 49 kilograms we have to convert this into grams to make sure our units cancel out properly. So 49 kilograms of water works out to be around 2700 moles of water. And how many uh, actual molecules of water is that? So this works out to be 1.6 times 10 to the 27th molecules of H2O. And the whole reason we went through this was to give you an order of magnitude feel for typical values of um, molecular weights, you know, in terms of, you know, not only how many grams per mole, but, you know, how much an atom or a molecule actually weighs. Um, also, you know, for typical substances, you know, that we were dealing with macroscopic scales, you know, how many molecules are actually present there. And also, you know, for macroscopic scales, uh, you know, how many moles we're typically going to be dealing with. Basically, here's our few little rules of thumb that will make our life a lot simpler here. So if we have a few grams to kilograms of a substance, all right, and this is a typical, you know, macroscopic quantity. So if we're dealing with something like a glass of water, that might have somewhere up to a few hundred grams of water in it. And, you know, that's going to be, you know, on the order of, you know, a handful of moles. All right, so it's, we're never going to be seeing, you know, really, really small values, you know, like 10 to the minus 27 moles or really, really large values like, you know, 10 to the plus 27 moles. This we're going to be seeing somewhere, you know, on the order of, uh, millions to a couple of thousand moles generally for, for most substances we'll be dealing with. We are never going to see 10 to the negative number of molecules or atoms. All right, This literally does not make any sense. If you just step back and think about what this would really mean, that would mean you're basically implying that the atom has been divided into many, many pieces. So if we have 10 to the negative whatever, that means that that atom or molecule has been subdivided into many, 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 many small pieces. And that, of course, cannot happen. The atom is the smallest uh, unit of an element, right? Uh, so just for example here, if I had 10 to the minus 2, that would mean that's 0.01 of that atom, which means that's 1 one hundredth of that atom. That makes no sense. That is impossible. That's a frowny face. Okay, so 
basically if this ever happens and you're doing some calculation here, you know, just like what we figured out here, how many molecules we actually have. This is plus 27. That's perfectly fine. But sometimes what happens is when folks are calculating this, they inverse this around. And instead of multiplying by Avogadro's number, they divide by Avogadro's number, and you wind up, you know, with like a 10 to the minus 27 here or something. And that makes no sense. All right, so you just have to be very, very careful of this. If you see this, odds are you goofed up, and then you have to go back here and look, did you multiply or divide when you did this calculation? Um, the other thing is here, you're never going to see 10 to the plus number of grams for the mass of a molecule or an atom. So for instance, right here, again, when we did our calculation on the mass of the water molecule, um, you know, AMUs, fine, that's we're going to be seeing, you know, maybe fairly large numbers here. But as for number of grams, you know, this is going to be, again, a very small number. Now, what, again, what can happen is somebody might divide instead of multiplying here or use the wrong conversion factor when they're doing this, and you're going to wind up with, you know, masses on the order of 10 to the plus 23 grams, which, again, makes no sense. All right, so, again, like I said, atoms are very small. Grams are fairly big. You know, this pen is on the order of grams. If we have 10 to the plus 23 of my pens, and actually 10 to the plus 23 grams is about the same as the mass of the largest asteroid we have in the solar system called Ceres right now. You know, we can't be saying that atoms are, you know, this large. If it is, again, that's a big frowny face, you know, if you happen to do that. So, um, you know, just keep an eye on your orders of magnitude, get a feel for these, and, you know, it's a great way to just go and error correct if you happen to do something wrong here. Now, another question you we might just wonder, um, what, how about a mole of moles? All right, well, the regular mole is about 55 grams if you look up their average weight. Okay, not exactly the cutest creatures out there, but uh, that's what they look like. And we can just figure out, well, it's 55 grams per mole, and then we just multiply that by Avogadro's number, we can figure out how much that's actually going to weigh. Okay, so if we go through and calculate this, 0.055, um, whoops, that should be kilograms. Uh, 0.055 kilograms per you know animal mole, and then we multiply this uh, 6.022 times 10 to the 23rd animal moles per you know Avogadro's mole, and we get here that's going to work out to be 3.3 times 10 to the plus 22 kilograms, and the Earth's moon for reference is 7.3 times 10 to the 22 kilograms. So basically, this is approximately half of the Earth's moon. And there's a very good little comic uh, from XKCD, uh, which actually explores the question: um, What would actually happen if you have uh, a mole of moles, and I highly recommend you to read it. It's actually kind of funny, and you know there's uh, talk in it about you know if you actually did form you know this size of moles, you would have you know basically a small little moon made of uh, bubbling mole meat uh, covered by fur and, and everything. So it's actually kind of interesting. So uh, I highly recommend you go and read that one. All right, now we did uh, look here a little bit at the molecular weights, but you know, just to uh, go through this and just to explicitly state what we're talking about. All right, so if we have, we want to calculate the molecular weight, it's basically just going to be the sum of the number of atoms times their individual atomic weights. And again, all the atomic weights, you know, we just get, you know, from here off the periodic table. So for instance, uh, we saw here for water, uh, this is going to be two times, and again, those numbers just come directly from here, okay, like this. And this goes to uh, 18.01528 grams per mole. So again, right here, this is two for the hydrogen, right? So this is, this is the atomic weight of hydrogen, and this is the atomic weight of uh, oxygen. And of course, there's one atom of oxygen here, and there are two atoms of hydrogen there, and that's these little factors I have in front. Okay, so that's fairly simple. You just have to uh, make sure that uh, you add everything up. Now, when you're doing this in practice, you know, let's say, you know, it's for the exam, um, of course, you'll have the periodic table in front of you. Do you actually have to go through and do all of these little numbers on here and, you know, drive your calculator absolutely bonkers and use the wrong number? Uh, well, fortunately, no. I mean, basically, this is going to be the rule um, that I'm just going to tell you to use when you're dealing with any of these calculations. So when you're doing this, just round to the tenths place. It will make your lives a lot easier. It will make grading a lot easier, um, and everyone will be happy. So in other words, if you just look at this, this would just be... So you can just round it to 18 grams per mole. And usually when I'm going to be going through and doing examples uh, later on, we're just going to round here to the tenths. 
you know, maybe just, you know, a lot of times will just come out to be a nice integer and we can just uh, stop it there. And once we start using these a lot, um, there's a few elements you'll just start using so much that you'll just uh, pretty much just memorize them. Uh, for instance, like carbon you'll know is 12, nitrogen's 14, oxygen 16, uh, chlorine is 35.5, hydrogen is 1. Um, those are elements we're going to be seeing a lot. Um, also, sodium is 23. So, you know, we'll see these quite often and it'll be actually, you know, almost second nature to uh, add some of these, thing, these things up here. All right, and then there's the other thing. Um, also, if you're dealing, and we'll see an example of this um, in a minute, let's say we're dealing with something like iron sulfate, and I wish I should say iron three sulfate. Now, when we're dealing with uh, compounds like this, uh, we have to remember that, you know, in these parentheses, this is really multiplying everything through. So really, this has here um, two irons, three sulfurs, and now this is going to be 4 times 3, 12 oxygens. All right. So that means when you actually do the calculation to figure out what the molecular weight of this is, uh, you have to you know, make sure that you actually multiply all of this stuff through here. So we can just uh, calculate this one. We can see here that uh, the iron, that's going to be 55.8. The sulfur is going to be 32.1. And oxygen, like we saw before, is just 16.0. So we can just easily write this out. And this works out to be 399.9 grams per mole. Okay, and one other little subtlety with terminology here. Generally, we just kind of refer to this as molecular weight. Um, but there's a more generalized term, which is sometimes used. It's called formula weight. All right, now formula weight kind of encompasses everything, you know, if we're just dealing with, you know, atoms, it's, that encompasses the atomic weight. Um, if we're dealing with water, which is a molecule, that's going to be encompassed in there as well. Um, if we're dealing with substances like this, which are ionic, technically they don't have molecules. So if you have like an iron uh, 3 sulfate crystal or a sodium chloride crystal, there's not actual molecules of iron sulfate or sodium chloride. It's really the formula unit that you actually have. Uh, because you know there is just a gigantic mass of uh, alternating positive and negative ions um, in there, so there's not really a molecule. So it's not really correct to technically call this molecular molecular weights, molecular formulas. But you know most folks just kind of do this without you know getting too technical. So I'm just letting you be aware um, of the fact that you know these are sometimes also called formula weights. If you happen to see that, you know just think of molecular weight. Um, it's basically all the same. All right, so we're going to do one last example here, which hopefully will tie in everything that uh, we've been talking about today. So let's say we have here 10 grams of calcium nitrate. We want to know what are my molecular weight. And again, this could also be technically called formula weight. So we want this answer here in grams per mole. This is definitely a long problem with a lot of uh, different parts to it. First of all, we're going to figure out what is the molecular weight of the calcium nitrate. This, of course, will be in grams per mole. Then we're going to look back and figure out well, what is the mass of an individual molecule. This technically an individual formula unit. And we'll find this answer here in grams and also atomic mass units. Uh, we'll look how many moles we actually have in this 10 grams here. Uh, we'll look how many molecules we actually have. And then we'll find out how many atoms of calcium, nitrogen, and oxygen we have. And also the total number of atoms that we actually have here. All right. So, a bit of a complicated one, but it's not too bad. And again, this is a really good practice one. So, um, if you want to, you can pause this, work it out for yourself, and then just uh, see what the answer is. And again, you know, just work this through. I can guarantee you'll be seeing this later on. All right. So first up, calculating the molecular weight of my calcium nitrate here. All right. So for the calcium here, going to our periodic table, calcium is 40.1, nitrogen is 14, oxygen is 16. And of course, I have two nitrogens. And here I have two times three, so that's going to be six oxygens. And that works out to be 164.1 grams per mole. So we already got one, one down. All right, so that's 164.1 grams per mole, so we can just write this up here. Now, remember um, from earlier when we talked about that the grams per mole and AMU are exactly the same? So this part is the easiest. All you have to do is write the exact same number here. Then we want to figure out um, well, what is the mass of this in grams? Um, again, we can just use our nice little conversion factor that we have. 
Just to remind ourselves, that's 1.66 times 10 to the minus 24 grams per AMU. So this is going to be 2.73 times 10 to the uh, minus 22 grams. All right, so we can write that number up there. All right, now how many moles do we have? Again, um, here this is going to be something that's given in the problem. So we see here we have 10 grams of the calcium nitrate. And we will just use our molecular weight that we have. And that is going to be... So that's 0 0.0609 moles of the calcium nitrate. And again, we can just write that up there. And, you know, since I only have here three sig figs, again, three sig figs, just uh, being consistent. Uh, how many molecules? Well, I just take the number of moles that I have, multiply that by Avogadro's number. Okay, 3.67 times 10 to the 22nd. So again, just write that up there. All right, and then uh, right here, this is actually fairly easy. Now that we have this number, we can figure out how many atoms of calcium, uh, nitrogen, and oxygen we have. So again, we just multiply um, this by how many atoms are actually in this uh, molecule right here. And that's just multiplying by one, so it's exactly the same. All right, and then we just uh, can write that up there, exact same number, that's fairly easy. How many atoms of nitrogen do I have? Well, we see here that there's two atoms of nitrogen per, per uh, molecule there. So this is just, I'm just gonna do that. That's gonna be two nitrogens per calcium nitrate. And that's going to be 7.34 times 10 to the 22 atoms of nitrogen. And again, you can just write that up there. And then for the oxygen, again, you know, we saw earlier we have 6. So just multiply this by 6. And that's going to be 22.02 times 10 to the 22 atoms of oxygen. And I just wrote this as this way so all my exponents are consistent. You could easily go 2.20 times 10 to the 23rd. That's, that's fine as well. And then, of course, for the total, well, we just add the number of calcium plus the number of nitrogen plus the number of oxygen. So you simply just add these numbers up, and we get here 33.03 .03 times 10 to the 22 atoms total. So anyway, this is a very um, good example um, just to see if you actually understand how to do all these. You know, make sure that you get you know, answers consistent with this. Um, you know, just try that, and uh, I will stop this there finally.